Welcome to the Elevating La Cultura podcast, a space where I talk with Latinas who are passionate about what they do and are willing to share that passion with others to change the narrative, especially for the next generation. Each season is centered around different topics, but all with a Latina perspective. Welcome to season eight, where we will talk all things corporate and higher education. I'm so excited to share these powerful stories. So vámonos, and let's get into it. Hola, today I'm chatting with Erika Perez, a mom, a wife, an artist, and a financial advisor. She was born and raised in Chicago, moved to New Orleans for eight years, and returned in the summer of 2021 to get back to her roots in the Puerto Rican community. Erika likes to say that she has lived many lives and isn't afraid of a good pivot. She went to DePaul University to study finance, then moved into education, worked in community engagement, leaned into her inner artist, and found her purpose in financial advising. She finds the link between all of them to be purposeful. When Erica is not at her scroll saw creating a new art piece or in meetings helping clients reach their financial goals, she is spending time with family, dancing, singing, or just sitting in quiet. She lives a multi-passionate life that suits her and helps her thrive. Good morning. I am so excited to be talking with Erica today. We met through the We All Grow community online, and I am so thankful that you put together this Amigas in Chai network for all of us in Chicago because I've been wanting to connect with more people in Chicago through the We All Grow community because most of my contacts are like in the California, LA, Long Beach area. And so it's been exciting to connect with you and other amazing jefas through We All Grow. But I'm excited to have you on the podcast. And so before we get into it, why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself? Oh, hi, everyone. Um, I, I really do love that group as well. We All Grow is amazing. Um, my name is Erika Perez. I'm working on saying it that way more often. Um, I, I'm from Chicago. I grew up here. I born and raised Humble Park, and I have been just kind of my journey's been all over. So I mostly lived in Chicago. I've studied abroad. I moved to New Orleans for eight years. Um, moved back two years ago. For a number of reasons, uh, you know, COVID mostly, <laughs> um, wanting to be closer to my roots, closer to my family. And it's just been, it's been a, a journey, I think is probably the easiest, best way to say it. I've had multiple lives. <laughs> um, I'm a finance major originally and worked in corporate for, I don't even know how many years, maybe four or five years. That wasn't for me. I went back to school to be a teacher. That wasn't my jam either and stayed in education for 11 years total. And then just, I kept moving into different things. And now um, I am an artist. I have my own business called Nola Taino. I am a woodworking artist and I, I love using photos to create, take a photo and make it look I see, I see different things when I see photos. You're a photographer, so you understand. Like, you see deeper into it. I see patterns, and I see shapes, and I cut them out in wood and create different pictures with that. I'm also a financial advisor, which is wild that I'm saying that in the same. <laughs> I'm two very different things. I use two different sides of my brain um, at all times, um, and... I'm also neurodivergent, so that actually explains why I'm an artist and financial advisor. I think if, if my neurodivergent community out there, you know that our brains work a little differently than some, some other people. And so I really try to lean into what optimizes my brain and is having both. I appreciate that you talk about like your artistry and all of your math skills, because like you said, that's not a typical uh, path. Like it's either you're an artist and you're tapping into your creativity or you're like really into math and science, that logical side, that right 
side, left side brain, but I am finding like, I'm finding that there's a lot of crossover, especially when I talk to Latinas or other people of color, like we're able to tap into both sides. My, and I see it with my kids all the time. And so I would love to hear more about your journey, especially as it's brought you into really leaning into your creativity while also really enjoying the work that you do in the financial area. It's being an educator. I think that's probably something that, that solidified this journey for myself. Um, I know that I don't teach anymore, but I just learned so much about brains and just how they work and having kids myself too. I think that just seeing and fostering things that wasn't, weren't fostered in me. I think when I was a kid, I was always very good at math. I was always very good at understanding puzzles and all of those things that, you know, are typical of one side of the brain. And that was fostered, but I also, you know, I, I growing up in Chicago, I went to the park district all the time after school because that's when my mom would pick us up. And they had wood shop, they had art classes, they had sports. So I did everything because I needed to. I had so much energy. And so I I dabbled in a lot of things that brought me joy that, you know, having my uh, my dopamine fix, right? <laughs> what is what is actually like bringing me joy in the moment? And so I learned how to do these things that my family really didn't even know about, honestly. Uh, my mom just like, we, we kind of honestly just would sign ourselves up for things. And she'd be like, all right, well, whatever, just sign up, sign yourself up for whatever you guys need. And I'll pick you guys up at five. And I remember making all of these like wood name plates and giving them as gifts in Christmas. And this was like sixth grade. I learned how to use a scroll saw when I was maybe 11 or 12. And which sounds crazy too. Like what you're worried, but I mean, as long as there's, there's safety, I remember getting yelled at by the teacher and never, I broke a blade. Like there was all these different things like Erica, you need to do this the right way. And it was, it would allow me to laser focus on something that was bringing me joy in that moment. And my family just thought I was the nerd. Like they didn't realize I had this other thing. Um, and I remember going to high school, like I was the nerd. And so which I love. I, I love that. Like, I will own that I am an absolute nerd. Um, but I, because of my schedule, I couldn't take the classes that everyone else would want to take. So I couldn't take art. I couldn't take all these other things. So I didn't take any art until I think I had to take two. I think I only had to take one credit. I didn't take it to my senior year and it was only choir that I could fit. And I was great. I loved, I was a singer too. So I sang <laughs> and that was all the fix that I got of it. And so I still was this like super nerd who was doing all the same things and excelling. I kind of found that as my identity in the moment too, but I forgot about this beautiful thing that I knew how to do that I didn't remember again until COVID. And that's wild. I had, I didn't remember that I used scroll saw, like that is a machine. <laughs> and it wasn't until COVID and I was already working in education at that time. Um, I was doing student recruitment for a charter network in New Orleans and I needed something else to do because I was locked in my house. And so I just, I bought a scroll saw to make a, a piece for my best friend who couldn't find something that was meaningful for her. She was trying to find a piece of art that was her son's name on it that was like linked to our island, to Puerto Rico. And it didn't exist. The thing that she wanted specifically, which was a whole problem in itself, right? <laughs> you could find all types of things that can link you to a community. And sometimes you have to make it yourself when you can't find what you want. And I was like, wait, I know how to use a scroll saw. Wait, I know how to, wait. Like, and that I had all these memories coming through and I was like, oh my God, I'm going to buy this scroll saw. And I bought some wood and again, I made this beautiful thing for her. And it was the first time I had cut out letters and names. It was the first time I'd 
you know, fed a, a blade through a pilot hole, like all these things that I hadn't done in 25 years, maybe. I can't think of how, I don't remember how old I was when that happened, but it was so long since I'd done this thing and it was natural. And I, I, I think about like my, our kids and kids dabble in all the things. Yes, there's, there people are physically, like, people are inclined to do things better than others in certain ways. And I know that, and I know that for a fact, but letting them explore has been so important to me because if I would, if I actually didn't have the freer reign that, that I had when I was in middle school to sign myself up for woodshop at the park district, I never would have done that. No one would have thought to sign up this tiny Latina. Like I'm, I'm five, one, <laughs> I've always been small. Like I was definitely smaller than like, no one would have thought to sign me up for, for, for that. Like, cause that doesn't, that's not typical. And it's something I was so incredible at. Um, and then I think of like, I do still need the other piece. I do still need to be the nerd. And so, you know, my journey through education has been, you know, me trying to figure out how I take my, my love of people and helping and my love of numbers. Like I worked in finance. I didn't love it. I was a math teacher. I was okay at it, but then I had a kid, so I never got really good at it. And you know, had to make all these different pivots to try to figure out how to do this thing that actually also comes naturally to me in a way that fit with my lifestyle and with my personality. Um, I, it's just, it's been so, so different, I think, than a typical journey. And I think that that's okay. Also, like, I, I love that about life, honestly, the fact that you know, as you, as you grow up, like, yes, schools for some people, schools for not, not for everybody. But if it is like, we see that people are not doing what they studied. Like it, it, it doesn't happen that way. It's, it's more about the habits. Right. And so I learned how to understand people and I learned how to work with numbers and I learned these other skills that I've fit into this career in a way that I didn't think would happen. I think back to when I was younger and like I said earlier, like it had to be one or the other, like it had to be math or like more of a educational foundation or it was your creative. And there are many people, especially like my generation, millennials, who are circling back around to the things that they dabbled in when they were younger and actually really loved and didn't have the chance to de develop those skills further because we were pushed to follow this more traditional education journey. And um, I love to hear the stories of how we are able to hold space for both when you were younger, like, was there something that you were like, this is what I want to be when I grow up? I remember two specific things, actually. So I remember in seventh grade, we had to dress up what we like, what we wanted to be. And we think of like, I think when, when most people think about what they want to be, they have a role model or someone that they want to emulate. And for me, it was my aunt, my, my, my titi. She was she worked in banks. And so I remember dressing up in this, like, I think it was like black and white herringbone, like Sue. And I was like, I'm going to be a banker, like my Titi Mimi. Um, and I remember that like vividly, but then I also loved, loved my teachers, like my math teacher. Like I still check in with my middle school math teacher. I did my student teaching at her school. She was the principal then. Like I, loved her relationships with us and her relationships with families. And so that also was another thing. I was like, well, maybe I'll be a teacher. So I always had this back and forth of what I wanted to do. And I eventually was able to do both at some point in my life, um, which I don't think happens often. Like I, I think a lot of people are like, I want my, my kid wants to be 
what does he want to be today? Like, I think today he wants to be a veterinarian. And so he probably finds out that, you know, they put dogs down, like he's probably going to lose his mind. But um, it's different and it changes. But mine actually, like, I did the things that I thought I wanted to do, but I didn't want to do them when I actually did them, if that makes sense. Like, I remember when I was in high school, I wanted to be, like, I was like, I want to be a teacher. And then I had family members who were like, you're not going to make money, Mina. Like, you need to find something different. And you should go into, if you're good with numbers, go into banking, go into finance. And so that's kind of where my journey ended up being because I listened to like the naysayers. Um, and I don't regret it though. Like I loved school and I, I started off in accounting. I hated that <laughs> and moved to, to actual like typical finance. And that, that's okay. Like that was good. Like I enjoyed that part. Um, it was really hard. Um, so like it, it organically still brought me somehow to the things that I thought I was going to be when I was a kid. Yeah, that's really cool. I, I love that you continued on that like math track. Um, I also enjoyed going to school, but I think it was more because that's the only way that I got validation. Um, and like I processed that during therapy but a lot of times yes. <laughs> like when you are validated and encouraged and told that you're good at a certain thing like you're like especially as a kid like you're you lean into that and that becomes like your escape or where you find your happiness because you're like okay I'm making my parents proud or I'm I'm doing the thing that I'm supposed to be doing because I'm good at it um but I'm glad that you have been able to really um, like apply it to your current life positively. And you're still like being able to uh, help people and really educate others in the financial space. Um, when you were going through all of your uh, schooling is there anything that kind of like shaped where you are now and how you teach? I feel like when I first, when I was in school, it was very, I went to DePaul University and during that time, like there were still like, I had a lot of Latino friends. Like, you know, you find your clique, you find your space. We hung out in the uh, pool hall. They had opened up a new um, student activity center. There was a pool hall. That's where we hung out. That's where we all met. We knew where to see each other. Um, but very few of them were in my classes. I would go to go to class downtown in Chicago, and if there was thirty people in my class, maybe two or three were people of color, and maybe not Latino also. So it might I might be the only person Latina in that classroom, um, and so that in itself was hard. And I remember like I never had. I think in my entire journey in school, I had one um one teacher i had two teachers actually one i blocked out because he was my spanish teacher he made me think that i was he thought that i was cheating in class because i can speak spanish with an accent but i don't speak spanish and that was a whole whole thing but um so i've had two people of color as teachers in my my career like at, at that school it's very different now, but that was, that was hard. And so like, I think it was more just not seeing what I wanted to be, not seeing the people doing it, not seeing it in practice. Um, I still have that, that trouble now. I think um, even, you know, being a teacher, I, in my class, when I went back to school, um, I got my master of arts in teaching at uh, National Lewis. There were like 25 people in my cohort. Three of us were people of color, maybe four. And so even that, like, and I've always, whenever I wanted to do something that would help my community, I always had to put myself in an educational space that was predominantly white. And I think I had just adapted to those spaces. I assimilated 
which is what we did back then. Now I'm, I'm a very different person. Now I'm like, I'm going to be authentic. I'm going to be who I am. But back then I was like, I just have to fit this mold because I have to get through this because it's what I need for my people and what I need to do to get through to what I want to do next. And so I always like hid myself in those moments. Um, and I think that was the biggest thing. Like, I don't, when I think about those times, like maybe I'm blocking them out. Maybe I need to talk to my therapist a little more about it to un to unlock some of them. But I don't remember any like specific microaggressions, but I think it might be because I assimilated and I just like, I probably just like tossed them to the side and didn't really think much in that moment because I was just like, I always had a shield and I was like, they're not talking to me. <laughs> um, I don't know if that answered your question. I feel like I went in a, a nice little journey. <laughs> Yeah, I don't know if you heard this growing up, but I definitely heard this idea that you have to work twice as hard because you're a woman and you're going to have to work even twice as hard on top of that because you are Latina. And so it was that like mindset that kind of drove all of this like um, pushing past all of the microaggressions and ignoring it because it was like, oh, well, this is what I have to do. So I'm just going to like, I'm going to have to work harder. And it was something that I accepted. And it wasn't like it has definitely changed in the past 20, 30 years. Do you remember and when that flip was for you? When it changed? Yeah. Yes. When you're like, yeah. Yeah. And it was uh, around 2016. It was during the political climate change. And I'm just like, what am I doing? Like, this is not it. And I am tired. And like, I don't want to have to tell my kids the same thing. Like, this is not right. Um, so, yes, I definitely relate to having to block it out or like just push through. And especially when you're in predominantly white spaces, because you are always focused on that end goal. Like, okay, I just need to get here. I just need to graduate so I can get the next, the job. And then once that, like, I just have to push through to continue advancing. Um, so how did you navigate that, that switch? And how do you, embrace or show up in your day-to-day -day now? Because I see you as someone who is very proud of who you are. And um, even though you are still in predominantly white spaces. So how is that for you? Um, I remember the switch and that's why I asked you, like, I remember the switch and it was, um, I don't remember the year because I'm really terrible with that piece. But I remember we started doing more diversity and inclusion work in our schools. And I remember saying, um, saying to them, I said, I don't know who's taught me this when I was younger. I don't know if it was in an actual word, if someone said it, or if it was me just observing it. But I always remembered this like idea of like, make yourself indispensable. Like no one can fire you. You need to know all the things, do all the things. I always did too much. I, I, I was like, okay, well, I already, I have this thing. What else? Like I, there was one point in schools, I had like four titles at once <laughs> because I was doing too many things. And I remember us starting to do this diversity and inclusion work and me saying like, I've always made, tried to make myself indispensable. And because of that, I've never been authentic. I'm louder than this. I'm not as nice as I look right now. Also, like I, I can, I can, I have things that go through my head that can be unkind sometimes. <laughs> I'm, I've always been silent. I think it's a mixture of of that. I've also been told I'm I'm sure you've gotten this like you're too much, you're too much, you're too much for people to handle, and so I always like dimmed my light, and and when we started having these conversations, and and when and the world was having these conversations at the moment, the the country was having them at the moment, I felt like these like layers coming off of me, like oh like my hair, I started wearing my hair curly, I started wearing my hoop earrings, like. I started doing things that I wouldn't typically do. Like I'm a financial advisor. I'm wearing a t-shirt and a blazer and my shoes are off right now. Like I'm like, <laughs> I, I've been able to like adjust and like 
I feel like it's still it's still a journey. I think um, in my current space um, at the company I work for, they have hired a lot more Latinos in the last year. Um, like men, women, I should start saying Latina. I like saying, I say that often in my head and then it doesn't come out. But <laughs> um, really seeing that and and being older, like I'm, I'm turning 40 in a few weeks. When this airs, I probably already will be on the fourth floor as someone of my, uh, I went to an uh, event and someone called it the fourth floor and I was like, I am using that forever now. Um, and so I'm one of the older people here. I'm a career changer. Um, and it's a mixture of like setting an example, being authentic in how I talk, try, I, like, I really just try not to mask. Um, I had a, a moment last week where I was speaking with my, my manager and he was like, Perez, slow down. I like being called Perez. I like being called by my last name at work. It just reminds me of, you know, just working in schools. And I realized that I don't mess with him and I speak very fast, especially when I'm in spaces I'm comfortable. And I realized this moment of like, oh, I don't have to mask. I don't mask with you. And like, he's a Italian Polish man. <laughs> and it was, it was this beautiful moment of like, I don't do this thing that I used to do all the time. I can be louder. I can speak my mind. I can tell people when something feels off, I can be genuine and it doesn't feel like I have to be on guard. And that, I don't think that that's typical just in, in the financial advising world. I think maybe it's, you know, it, it is changing. I think it might be typical of our office and, and the team that has been built here. Um, I also work in a predominantly, uh, like it's mostly women on my team. Um, it's a mixture, I think at this point, but like the ones I'm closest with, there's more women in this office than there's ever been. And, and so I think it's unique the time that I've, I've decided to make this move. Um, I think before that, like it's, I've left places because I, I don't feel comfortable. And, and now that, now that I know that I need that, like, it's, it's why I left education. I felt like I couldn't be myself in that specific moment. I felt like I, I was burned out also, um, but I couldn't be who I needed to be in that moment because it was just, it wasn't who I, who I wanted to be. It wasn't showing up as myself anymore. And I needed, like, I needed to separate myself and figure out what I want to do and what is important. And it caused that pivot um, I was not well. I, I was mental health was like, I couldn't get out of bed. And the only reason I got out of bed was because of my children. I, I was like, Oh, got to take them to school. So got to be present. And you, you turn on that, like that, that mommy turns on sometimes and you just got to do what you need to do. And then I would go to work and I just, I was so miserably unhappy and that is just not who I am. I am a ball of joy most of the time. And I couldn't, I, I felt I was just faking every day and I couldn't do it anymore. And so that's when I started leaning into my art. I took the whole summer off. Like literally like I quit in April. It took me about a, a, a month and a half to even like touch my scroll saw. Um, and then I just worked on art and I just shut out everything um, the sound of the saw, like it, it quiets my brain. My brain is literally on fire all the time. <laughs> and I was able to just like have silence and peace and breathe and lean into this piece that I needed to do. I needed that in that moment. And just to figure out what I wanted to do and who I wanted to be in this next part of my life, my next life. I always say I'm a cat. Um, and, and now that I'm here, and I feel like that is just like, I, I did it on a whim. It showed up as a LinkedIn re like recommendation, like you should be a financial representative. I was like, that, I know that sounds weird, but that makes sense. Like, I, I feel like that was, that's also not typical. Men will be like, yes, <laughs> I'm going to apply for all the things. And, you know, usually as women, we are always 
second guessing, especially as Latina women, like, oh, well, I don't have this and this and this and this qualification. And so you look through the list and we don't, we don't usually just apply. And I had this moan of like, why not? Like, why not try something new? You don't know what you want to do. All these other, you know, interviews and things that you're doing and trying to get into didn't make sense. So why not? And just hearing the story of like why my manager was, was doing this. He also made a pivot. Um, he has two girls and he's like, I want to create a space where women feel safe and I feel proud to bring my girls to. And I was like, I'm in, <laughs> I don't have girls myself. <laughs> I was like, I want to be there for your girls. I, I just literally just gave it a, gave it a go. Um, and that's not typical. Yeah. I want to go back because you mentioned that you stepped into the corporate world for a short time and it wasn't for you. Can you explain why and how that transition out of the corporate world was for you? When I graduated, I remember um, applying for different jobs and I, I didn't take advantage of internships the way that um, I probably should have in, in college, but I remember just starting and I, I worked at a bank for a little bit and a credit union and pivoted out of there. And I started working in an accounting department for a manufacturer and just everywhere I went, I was like, I'm not doing good for people. Like it just, it, it was the helper in me. Like I really love people. And I was like just making money for people that didn't look like me. And I think that was, that was part of it. It was also those old school, dark cubicles <laughs> and like that in itself, like I didn't feel like I was getting enough sun. I, I, I wanted to help my community and I started mentoring at Erie neighborhood house. And as I was mentoring, I just had like, just, I was around all these teenagers and it's like, this actually feels better. Like this is me doing what, what makes sense. And that pivot, I remember I applied to uh, Teach for America and didn't get in. And I was like, am, am I making the right move? Like, is this, like, I felt, you know, you get like all these obstacles and you're like, all right, am I going to keep going or am I going to stop? And I kept trying for all these different things and I wasn't doing it. I was like, well, maybe I'm, maybe I'm not supposed to be a teacher. And I got into a program that was, you know, a, a non-traditional like path because I was a finance major, but none of those classes qualify as actual math. And I got into a program that was a two-year program. And I told my boss, I was like, hey, I really want to do this new thing. Like, I think it makes more sense for me. I really want to, like, can I still stay here part-time while I do this? And it was a big shift because I was making decent money, at least for that time, and was getting a, taking a pay cut, was um, not, like, I was already living a life of, like, traveling all the time. I would go somewhere new every couple months. Like, it was like, I'm just going to visit everyone and everywhere. And I had to stop. And I had to like take this moment. I think I was 26 at the time. And it's like, I'm going to go back. I'm going to do this different thing. And it felt, I, I think when it, when I make decisions, like I just like, it, it is what it is. I'm done. I'm doing something new. Like it, it never, I think, cause I'm always processing and rationalizing all the time. So when I made a decision and if it's come out of my mouth, like that is the decision. And so once I speak it, like, speak it, it's just kind of what I end up doing running <laughs> with like blazing fire toward. Um, and so it was a hard decision, I think, when, when like the processing of it initially, but once it came out, I was like, this is what I'm going to do next. Like, are you help? Are you going to help me? And they were great and let me stay while I was in school. Um, and I just had like four jobs that last, like when I was doing my student teaching, I was like, okay, well, I still have to have money coming in. I still have to do these things. And I think I was, I worked at a school for students with autism. I did tutoring. I worked with a school, um, like a charter network, helping with them with their applications. And then I was singing on a boat, like literally had four jobs at once while I was doing student teaching because it was like, well, like I need money still and this provides nothing. And I do, I do a lot. I do too much. So what are the too muches that I'm going to do that make me happy? 
Um, and so it, it was a hard in the moment, but the adjustment and doing it felt natural. I am the same way. Like if I have an idea, like, and I can't stop thinking about it, like eventually I'm going to do it. Like, it's just a matter of how and when I just cannot let it go. Uh, So I appreciate you sharing that because I think a lot of people can relate. It's like, oh, we know that we have the capacity or like we have the capability to do it. It's just a matter of figuring it out. And then once we achieve it, we're just like, yes, I did it. Um, did it next <laughs> yes exactly then it's like okay now what now what um you also mentioned that you are neurodivergent and I think that it is helpful to talk about that especially in adults because I'm hearing more people realize that they are neur- neurodivergent and wish that they would have known a lot sooner and uh, I, I'm curious and I'm interested to hear that part of your story. So with that, like we knew that when I was a kid, like my mom knew it, but, but during that time, like she was terrified of Ritalin. She was terrified of getting me evaluated because of what they would tell her to put me on, honestly. And I remember, and I've talked through this with my therapist, but I remember like people not wanting to take me with them because I was a lot for them to handle because I was a firecracker. I was all over the place, like sticking stuff to walls, drawing everywhere. Like I got my son's actually very similar, my youngest. And I was like, oh, you get one that's just, just like you. Um, and so I just, I always, you know, there's, I have ADHD and, you know, ADHD, it's, what they typically say is like, oh, they can't focus in school. They can't do, there's all these like typical ideas of what it looks like. Oh, squirrel. Like, yeah, I do notice the squirrel. Yes. But also like it, it's all about um, hyper-focus. And so I would hyper-focus on the things that brought me joy. And like my, my home, my home life was not always super stable And so when I would go to school, like that is, that was the most stable, the most routine, everything was like, I understood and knew what was coming next all the time. And so I thrived in school because of that. Like that was where my dopamine was. That was where my joy was. I love my family and love everything and love my journey, but like it, it was rough a lot of times. And so we always knew, but because I was always thriving in school, we never did anything about it. Um, it wasn't until when I was teaching and I was not teaching, I was actually working in schools in New Orleans. I was doing operations and there was this one point that I took over HR, the many jobs I've had, but it was the first time I had to like sit and like look through documents. And it was, we were transitioning from paper, uh, HR forms to linking a bunch of different systems. And I had to focus so hard and it was, it felt impossible because I needed to be moving and it just didn't bring me that, that dopamine to like be, be able to hyper-focus on this thing that needed to get done. And that's when I was, I think I was maybe 20, no, wait, I was in my thirties. New Orleans was thirties. I was maybe 34. And I was like, all right, I need to get evaluated and talk to some friends who were already you know, already neurodivergent, had ADHD or other things, and they recommended a few doctors. And I got diagnosed. I, I went on medication. I know that's not the journey for everyone. It's what I think I needed at the moment. Um, and we went on this whole journey of like trying to figure out what was the right dosage for me, what um, what like put me like in the right level, so that when I come home. I can still be a good mom because that was, I think, the other hard part because when you're neurodivergent, your brain is working so hard to be typical and to work in the society that works on, on, you know, not neurodivergent brains, neurotypical brains. And we work so hard and we come home, we can take off the mask. But when you're taking off the mask and you have kids that are like, they don't let you have your own body, they need things and you need to just decompress. I was not kind. 
And so I think that was the other piece of it was like, I needed to figure this out because I needed to be a good mom too. I couldn't just be good at my job and I needed to be like, feel whole in all the spaces. And so it's, it's been, it was hard and it was, you know, something that just needed to happen. And there have been moments where I didn't have insurance for a little bit, especially when I quit my job and went into art where I didn't have my medication, but I was thriving because I was doing art and I was doing, so I had these, I, I was okay. But once I had to get, once I decided to move back into corporate and have a job that I do have to meet with people and the meeting with people is actually the easy part. I can talk to anyone. It was more the like, okay, now you have to, sit down and analyze and build a plan, which your brain is able to do. You just need a little help sometimes. And it's okay. I think when I think people, especially I think our generation has their similar stories to me. Like there, I have so many friends who got diagnosed in their thirties and their you know late twenties because they were trying to do a thing that they couldn't do. And, and they had to figure it out. Um, I think working in schools also allowed me to understand brains so much as well. So I knew my brain. Like ADHD brains thrive in education because a classroom, all over the place. Um, and the same thing with even uh, with art spaces. And, and so even my son, my son, uh, my oldest, Mikey, he's um, neurodivergent has ADHD and I saw it in him very, very early and saw like, it doesn't, it didn't look the same as mine, but because I knew kids, I knew something that he needed some assistance and and really understanding the process of, of getting him evaluated, getting him a 504 plan, things that I probably needed as a kid. And a lot of my family probably needed and a lot of people that they didn't have and teachers didn't know. And now there's, there, there's, it's, a, be- a world where people are at least aware. And so it's a, it's a easier to navigate. It's not easy to navigate. It is easier <laughs> um, because if I didn't know the education space, I don't think that he would even have any, like a 504 at this point. Yeah, I really appreciate you sharing this part of your story. I think that there needs to be more story shared and we can just create more conversation and um, bring awareness to neurodivergency. Um, I have enjoyed this conversation so much. I always ask people, what encouragement or advice do you have for the next generation? Oh, I think I think it's it's around change. I think initially, like change as a whole makes me nervous. Like I don't like when the lights are changed in my office. I don't like like the small things, but you don't have to fear change. I think who would have thought that a corporate girl turned teacher turned artist turn multiple other things, turn financial advisor would be here. And I think it all flows as well. Like there's, there's things to learn from wherever you are in your journey and it doesn't have to lock you in. It's just, oh, I did this thing. It's great. It all kind of feeds into the same thing. Like the people that I help, I help lots of musicians and artists and I help Lots of Latina people. I I try to in my my business try to help people that have been part of my journey that I can relate to, and I think it's okay to embrace the change that happens naturally throughout life, even if you're scared. Kind of just just do it anyway. Yeah, kind of like what do you have to lose? Like just try it. If it doesn't work, that's okay. Yeah. Um, there, I know we, I think you've written about the, um, fake it till you make it. And I have a friend, he's a dancer. And I remember going to one of his classes and he was like, 
none of this fake it till you make it BS. Like, no, you're going to fight till you find it. And it was, it just changed my whole view of this world. Like, I'm not faking it. I am fighting for my space. I'm fighting for, um, to be noticed and to be elevated. And that's, that's the world we live in. Got to fight and we're doing it. Yes. And hopefully like our hard work pays off and our, the next generation doesn't have to fight as hard and they just get to enjoy. Just get to be. Just oh, get wouldn't to be. that be beautiful? Yes. <laughs> Yes. Thank you for this conversation. Where can people find you, especially your art? Um, my art, it, I'm not, I don't have a website, but you can look at my art at, um, on Instagram at Nola Taino Arts. Um, for financial advising, you can find me on, um, on Instagram advisor. I think I got that right. And on LinkedIn, honestly, I think when it comes to business, that's where most people find me. Um, and I'm open to just talking to anyone about either of those two things. because I love them so much. Yes, I definitely am an advocate for people having a financial advisor. I think there is not enough um, well, we, at least I did not have the language or the, the skills to talk about finances. Like everything was like, oh, you don't talk about that or you don't, don't share any information, but I've seen the value in having someone in your corner and like helping you think through the things in your life and your financial decisions. So I am so glad that we got to talk because I think people need that person to kind of just help you and set you up for like the foundation of, of your finances, because it's not what we were taught. And I'm, I'm hoping more people like start, start doing that in their own lives. It's not scary. I think, you know, being a finance major myself, like I never learned this. Like it wasn't required for me to take financial planning. And so I knew how to, I knew about stocks. I knew about, you know, international business and I knew all these things and real estate, very good at the real estate stuff. But I, I didn't know the principles that, and just like the basics of what we need to do. And I think about schools and that they don't teach it either. Um, not in a way that makes sense to, you know, someone who's about to go off to college. And I, I make sure that I, I do meet with people of all different backgrounds. So I have college students that I talk to. I have attorneys that I talk to. I, I don't, I don't like close myself off to the conversations. And, and I don't have a typical um, demographic that I serve or a typical client that I serve because I think that sometimes it's, it's more about the people who have not had the conversation before, um, the people that have been overlooked. So maybe I do have uh, clients, <laughs> but it, it's, it's more about helping the people that have not just not don't know and it's so important and I wish that I I don't wish that I had done it sooner because I, I like my journey and I believe I'm where I am at at the moment that I need to but I wish more people were in the business more people that looked like me were in the business or more people just learned these basics so that our community can thrive faster and I love that it, there is there are a lot more people like you and I, be more, more Latinas that are joining this, like, are joining the conversations and are less scared of the conversations. You know, there's people who um, sometimes will say, well, let, let, Latina, they don't have money. I'm like, it's, it's like, I don't know the exact number, but like, trillions in GDP like <laughs> it, it it it's not true and it's literally the education that is missing and I'm I'm glad to be a part of that education for people 
Yeah, I really appreciate you doing the work that you do for our community and um, busting those myths and shifting the narrative. So thank you so much. This has been a great way to start my morning. So I appreciate you. I appreciate you. Thank you so much. This has been fun. Yes, and I'm sure we'll connect soon. So I'll see you later. All right, bye. What a great conversation and how encouraging that Erica shows us that we can hold space for the many passions and skills that we invite into our lives. Okay, amigos, thank you so much for listening. There'll be a new episode every Tuesday. So after you listen, feel free to take a screenshot to post on Instagram and tag at Elevating La Cultura, or you can send me a DM. You can also comment on this YouTube video if you're watching online. I always like to hear from people and how they resonate with the stories that I share. So leave a review on Apple Podcasts so we can get more ears listening to these stories and we can continue elevating La Cultura. And if you haven't already, join the Elevating La Cultura Comunidad on Facebook and check out the website elevatinglacultura.com to see what in-person events I've got going on for you. In a few weeks, I'm reopening the doors to the Showing Up Latina in Business Mentorship Program, designed exclusively for Latina business owners and leaders. Since being a business owner for 13 years, and with all the millions of pivots I've had to do in the past six years, I found so much value in the people who I can bounce ideas off of, vent to, and cheer me on through all the challenges. Many of us are in this time of transition or pivoting and feel like we're on the cusp of something that's about to pop off in our business. If you're a solo entrepreneur, you know the struggle of doing all the things all the time and trying to keep up with all the new trends when it comes to social media. It can be overwhelming, which is getting in the way of faster growth. If you've been thinking it would be great to have an accountability person or someone to bounce ideas off of and brainstorm next steps with, I'm your person. All right. Enjoy the rest of the day, afternoon, evening, whenever you're listening. Y nos vemos next week. Bye.